Okay, we'll wait another minute and then I'll, I'll go ahead and kick off with some housekeeping announcements. And um, then we'll get ready to go. So let's let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and welcome to the 2022 Stellar Society Lecture at Guilford Tech. This year brought to you again virtually, our second year in a row doing this virtually. Um, this event is part of the North Carolina Science Festival. You can see the banner behind me. Um, it's an annual statewide celebration of science that provides hundreds of fun, interactive science learning opportunities throughout the month of April. And so now that April's underway, we're excited to be one of the kickoff events for the festival this year. Visit ncscifest.org to find other fun science events near you. There's a lot going on um, this year. Guilford Tech will offer two additional NCSF events this year. We're a host site next week for the statewide star party. And so that means weather permitting um, on Friday, the 8th of April, we'll provide telescopic views of the moon, star clusters, double stars, and nebulae galaxies. Uh, the session starts about 8.30 as darkness falls, weather permitting, of course. And our public viewings at Klein Observatory uh, continue on Fridays after that, weather permitting. Um, as always, we start at dark um, during March through October. On Friday, the 22nd of April, Guilford Tech's science faculty and students will host a science hall open house, an evening of interactive activities for the whole family. The event runs from 6 o'clock to 8.30 and features a range of biology, chemistry, physics, geology, and astronomy demonstrations and activities. Klein Observatory will be open afterward if conditions allow. We'll also do some solar observing at the beginning of the event. Um, Special thanks go out to our donors and volunteers who help make the observatory's outreach programs possible and to the GTCC Foundation for its uh, continuing support. And also to Leanna Martin, who makes these um, virtual sessions possible for us. And she also does great work for the in-person sessions in supporting us with the AV. So the big event for tonight, we're happy to have Paul Byrne with us as the 20 22 Stellar Society lecturer. The Stellar Society is Guilford Tech's um, Student Astronomy Club. Um, for many years, uh, a couple of decades now, they've uh, their mission has been to support our outreach programs and they help us figure out who we want to invite for speakers. And each year the um, Stellar Society lecture becomes an honorary member of the club. So Paul, you're going to receive from us a- awesome, Thank you. Stellar <laughs> Society t-shirt. So um, I'll be in touch with you about making sure I send you the right size. Dr. Burns spent a few years here in the Carolinas at NC State University, but we recently lost him to the Midwest, where he's now an associate professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. He received his BA in Geology and PhD in Planetary Geology from Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. And then he serves postdoc positions as a messenger postdoctoral fellow at the Earth and Planets Laboratory at Carnegie Institution of for Science in Washington, and as an LPI postdoctoral fellow at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston. His research focuses on comparative planetary geology, comparing and contrasting the surfaces and interiors of planetary bodies, including Earth, to understand the geological phenomena at the system's level. And his interest spans the solar system from Mercury to Pluto, and increasingly to the study of extrasolar planets. He uses remotely sensed data, numerical and physical models, and field work in analog settings here on Earth to understand why planets look the way they do. And you may know him from Twitter if you follow us at uh, the Klein Observatory account as the planetary guy. If you don't, you should check him out. He regularly shares and discusses solar system images there from the surface of Mars to the rings of Saturn to the moons of Jupiter to Venus, which he's going to tell us about tonight. So, Paul, let me turn things over to you and, and let's hear about Venus. Awesome, Tom. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen and make sure that's working. Um, and I want to confirm that you can hear me okay. 
Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom, for that great introduction and for the in invite to speak with you today. Um, it's my pleasure to be here virtually uh, coming to you from here in St. Louis in the Midwest. Um, I'm going to share with you the talk is titled Some New Insights into the Geology of Venus because uh, honestly, we're learning new stuff almost weekly. Um, and, and the main, well, one of the reasons for that is because last summer, Everything in the Venus exploration landscape changed when NASA announced that it was going to pick two new missions to Venus. And the week later, the European Space Agency picked a third. So we went from having zero missions to sort of the interior and the, and the structure and the surface of Venus in the last 30 years to three. So in that time, the Venus community has become reinvigorated and, and we're discovering more and more stuff. As you go back to old data, decades old data, I'm going to share with you the results of two studies that we've published in the last two years, one of which focuses on Venus as we understand it today, and the other which focuses on Venus as it may have been in the past. I'll allude more to why that's important in a couple of minutes. But I want to go just give you a sense that this is a very kind of very light overview of the geology of Venus, which is a world that is just a fascinating place. And I'll talk a little bit about why it's important for us to study Venus. Uh, so let me just introduce you briefly to give you the vital statistics for Venus. It's an Earth-sized world in the habitable zone, which is a phrase you may know, uh, around a very standard kind of star, a main sequence star, a G2 type. Uh, it is 82% Earth mass, so it's a little more than four-fifths the mass of Earth. It's a little smaller, it's 95% Earth radius, which means its density is a little lower. It's probably got a little less iron in it than Earth does, but it's probably largely the same stuff in about the same proportions. We assume it's the same age as Earth. It orbits the same star. It orbits a little closer, its average orbital distance is about 70% that of Earth's or standard one AU astronomical unit distance from the sun, uh, which is about 150 million kilometers. So Venus is around 107 or so. So it gets about twice as much sunlight as we do or, or incident solar radiation insulation. Now, one of the, in, there's a lot of interesting stuff about Venus, and this is not a talk about the interesting stuff of Venus, so that's a whole other talk, but I want to try and make this interesting for you too. One of the kind of surprising things happened in the 60s when it came to our understanding of Venus. On the basis of its distance to the sun, there was a view widely held by romantic science fiction authors and scientists alike that Venus was this lush tropical rainforest like world because it was closer to the sun. Yeah, but not very much so. And if you were to assume that Venus was a perfect black body, which is a sort of conceptual idea for how things receive energy and emit them. And of course, nothing is then by rights, the average surface temperature of Venus should only be a 28 or 29 Celsius. Uh, now, the average surface temperature of Earth should be, by that metric, around 20 Celsius, and of course it's not. Uh, but we did think, we humans thought, that up until the 60s, that Venus might actually be a very tr lush tropical world and perhaps teeming with life. Uh, after all, it was almost earth size. Why wouldn't it be quite similar to Earth in terms of the kind of flora and fauna that it had? The first successful interplanetary flyby, the first time humans successfully got a spacecraft to fly past another planet, not the moon, another planet, it was NASA's Mariner 2 mission in 1962. Mariner 2 is, uh, it was about two and a half meters tall, seven feet. It's not a big spacecraft. It's still out there somewhere orbiting the sun, probably. But Mariner 2, no cameras, nothing fancy, but it had the ability with, with, with its instruments, its radio instruments, to detect radio waves coming from the lower portion of the planet. And with that energy, that, that electromagnetic energy it was able to detect, it was able to make some estimate of how hot the lower atmosphere was, uh, confirming some indirect evidence from microwave studies done on Earth the previous year or so that in fact the surface of Venus was hellishly hot. And it is, it's, it's Helmadrial. It's about the temperature of a self-cleaning oven. People often say it's the temperature of lead or the temperature required to melt lead. I have no intuitive idea for how hot it needs to be to melt lead, but I can tell you that self-cleaning oven is hot. You don't go near it when it's on. That's the standard temperature of Venus. And interesting too, the Mariner 2 spacecraft also failed to resolve any magnetic field and the internally generated magnetic field. That was a real surprise because Earth has one. We found out in 1974 that Mercury generates its own field and Ganymede, the largest moon of Jupiter, largest moon in the solar system, bigger than Mercury actually, uh, also generates its own magnetic field, but Venus doesn't. That was kind of weird. Um, I'll kind of touch off that a little bit later. But so there were some surprises. Now, when it comes to understanding Venus and Venus as a world it, we kind of have to understand it in the context of why it's different to Earth. Because on paper, it's really similar. And it should be similar in terms of its surface processes and the geology it has, and it's not. And so we have these kind of two models, a tale of two planets, really. One is that Venus was doomed from the start. 
that this is an artist's impression of a, of a magma ocean, right? So you can imagine a young sun. Venus is never this close to the sun. But this is Venus. It's got a magma ocean. It's extremely hot. It's just formed. It's got an enormous amount of radiogenic heat producing elements. Stuff is smacking into it, bringing it with a whole pile of impact heat. And it's getting a lot of heat from the sun. And it is not able to shed itself of the heat fast enough. And as a result, even though it's producing a huge amount of water that's coming out of the interior through a process we call degassing, and this water is being retained because the planet's big enough to hold on to it, this water isn't able to condense out into liquid water, which is where our oceans first came from. It came out of condensing from a steam-rich atmosphere, an atmosphere that dropped below the boiling point, and things are clement enough on Earth for that steam to turn to liquid and to pond in the cratering lows, and they were the first seas and lakes we have on Earth. If per this model, Venus was never able to escape that fate, then it entered into what we call a runaway greenhouse effect. And that is to say that it was continually trapping more energy, more thermal energy than it could release. And as a result, that atmosphere became thicker and thicker and thicker. It, it wasn't able to draw the carbon in its atmosphere down to the interior, the way Earth can through plate tectonics. And you end up with the present day conditions. Temperature, that of a self cleaning oven, about 475 Celsius or around 740 Kelvin. Uh, temperature, or that's the temperature, the pressure equivalent to about 900 meters under the ocean. Uh, almost a half a mile under the sea on Earth is the equivalent pressure of this, the standard sea level. We have a reference sea level on Venus. Um, pretty horrible. And that's before you get to silver gas clouds and stuff. So this is scenario one. Venus, a planet just like ruined from the beginning, principally as a function of its distance to the sun. Now, the other scenario is that Venus was somehow, and we have ideas as to how it might have done this, somehow Venus was able to escape this early hard fate, this infernal destiny where it turns into planet hell, at least for a while. And so instead, Venus was able to, we think possibly with the aid of a big hemisphere-spanning cloud, it was able to cool down enough that despite all the impact energy and the insulation, the incident solar radiation from the sun, it was able to cool down enough that this water-rich atmosphere could condense out from steam and, and start to form oceans. In the process, potentially locking some carbon in the form of carbonate minerals out of the air, locking them into the water, and potentially in the way that Earth does, modern Earth does, with plate tectonics, introducing that carbon back into the interior and regulating its own planetary temperature. Now, if that happened, then for a potentially protracted period of time, there may have been two large blue marbles in the solar system. Uh, you may have heard people tell you that Mars was once blue. Mars was never blue. Mars may have had a northern ocean, though I probably didn't. It certainly had liquid water flowing over the surface, but for very short periods of time, possibly a few months or maybe a few years. It was never a tropical oasis of water, ever. And it certainly wasn't blue. Uh, Venus might have been. Might not have been. Might always have been creamy yellow, but it could have been blue. And there's some stuff I'm going to intentionally skip over, which we can come back to if, you're, if you've got questions, as to why we think this might be the case and how we're going to test it. So understanding Venus is important for a couple of reasons. And I'm going to kind of summarize, I'm going to end the talk on these, these talking points, why it matters that we study Venus. But suffice to say, the overall dominant question that drives us really kind of studying anything for Venus is understanding why it's not like Earth. And the reason this matters more so recently is because we've started to detect more and more Earth-sized worlds orbiting other stars, these exosolar or extrasolar, extrasolar or exoplanets. And the reason it matters is because if we decide or if we determine, let's say we identify an Earth-sized object orbiting in the habitable zone, which is a term rife with problems, orbiting at some more you know, distance to its host star, we right now don't have any means of establishing whether it's Venus-like or Earth-like, or even if we should expect it to be one or the other. And that's one of the important things that Venus is going to be able to help us answer. Should we expect it to be Earth-like? Is that a common outcome? Or is Venus-like the common outcome? So in this talk, as I said, I'm going to go through kind of two stories. This is a tale of two studies now. One focusing on stuff that's happening, we think, on Venus today, and one that we think is germane to Venus's past. How far back is the big unknown? But I'll talk about that in a moment. So first, I'm going to talk to, a bit to you about the tectonics of Venus. And, and I'll describe what that means and put it in some sort of context for you. So let's start off with this. We have this basic tenet 
Venus is a highly tectonically deformed world. That is, it has loads of tectonic structures. It has bits where the crust is pulled apart and bits where the crust is pushed together. It has faults, it has folds. It's all the kinds of structures we're familiar with. Interestingly, it is the most tectonically deformed place in the solar system except for Earth. It's true that parts of, say, the outer shells of Europa or Ganymede are complex tectonically in Solidus. But in terms of pound for pound, the structures you see and the types of structures you see, you just don't find anything else in the solar system except for Earth. And maybe that isn't surprising. Right? It's the only other thing that comes close to our planet's size. And it's presumably it's heat engine and the vigor of that heat engine. Uh, but highly tectonically deformed, tectonically deformed. However, Venus does not have plate tectonics, which is the key thing that characterizes Earth. Plate tectonics govern the shape of the continents, the land masses, and where they go and control speciation, life forms on Earth. Plate tectonics is the means by which Earth is able to regulate itself through this process I mentioned. It can draw down carbonate mil uh, minerals, car calcium, well, carbon in these calcium carbonate minerals, draw these minerals down, and then through the process of subduction, introduce them back into the mantle, where they get recycled, and eventually they come back out again as things like CO2 and CO in volcanic eruptions. It's the carbon silicate cycle. The onset of plate tectonics isn't something we understand well at all for Earth. We have a rough idea of how it works. We don't know how long it'll last. Um, but we do know that it's an important process. We also don't know what it looked like a billion years ago or three billion years ago. There's evidence that something happened like the, like plate tectonics. It might not be quite the style we see today. The point is that for all its tectonics, for all the structures that make it a heavily tectonized world, we do not see the kind of network of spreading centers where a new ocean crust is made or subduction zones where stuff is lost and, and recycled back into the interior. We don't see that mosaic of uh, tectonic plates that we see uh, on Earth. We do not see that in Venus. But we do see a lot of really interesting stuff. This is a global map of the topography of Venus, as told to us by NASA's Magellan mission, which was a radar mapping mission that operated there from 1990 through 1994. Here, the colors, the dark blue is relatively low-lying terrain. The kind of lighter colored yeah, cream and, and green is relatively high-standing areas. There are some big high-standing areas here, in like a big highland area here in the, in the equator. This is called Aphrodite Terra. And there's a big chunk up here and that's called Ishtar Terra. There's some other high standing things. There are huge rift zones, lots of really interesting stuff. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these places. But the take home message is we don't see tectonic plates. And for a long time, that led to this view that Venus is, a, is what we call a stagnant lid world. This is a word that, or a term that was devised, I think, in the 80s originally, to describe a world where not a lot happens. And if you think the kind of canonical idea of it is it's the moon or Mars or Mercury, the outer shell of these planets is completely intact. It's got impact craters and it's got holes and it. it's got tectonic structures, but nothing moves laterally, not really. Everything tends to move up and down. Stuff gets pulled apart, it drops down, stuff gets pushed together, it pops up. They're vertically dominant tectonics. Stuff tends to go up or down. And the reason the lateral stuff, the side to side horizontal stuff matters is because that's what characterizes plate tectonics on Earth. You can start off with the spreading center in the middle of the Atlantic and you can run that oceanic plate out to the passive margins in Africa or in the east coast of the United States. Or you can take the spreading center in the East, in, in the east Pacific rise in the Pacific Ocean and you can follow that bit of plate all the way over to the Andes where it subducts. So the character, the, the main characteristic of plate tectonics is huge distance traveled. And that is not what you see in these stagnant worlds. Now in this, this is a really interesting paper that came out four years ago where these folks looked at almost every solid state, solid surface object in the solar system, trying to classify them. Venus kind of sits sort of, it's not in what they call the terminal stagnant lid, which sounds really bad, Moon and Mercury, where really there hasn't been much action in about three billion years. Venus is somewhere maybe, maybe a bit more active than Mars, perhaps not quite as active as Jupiter's moon Io. But it's still thought to be within this kind of stagnant lid regime where, you know, the dominant mode of heat loss is this conduction through an otherwise static outer brittle layer. Uh, and I think that's wrong. Now, I'm going to talk through why I think that now. So we know that the planet's full of tectonic structures. And there are places where these structures uh, form very distributed areas where, you know, over a couple hundred kilometers is lots of these faults, let's say. But there are also places where a lot of these structures are kind of bunched together into bands. Bands where the ground is being pulled apart and bands of structures where the ground is being pushed together. And that's not surprising. We've known about that since the 80s, since we got the first Venera 15 and 16 radar data. 
What's interesting is, and something that had been kind of noted, but not really before we came along, we published this in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science last summer, is that in places at least, these kinds of belts or bands of structures kind of interconnect. And in doing so, they tend to outline or delimit low-lying areas that are relatively undeformed. And that's an interesting kind of pattern. You don't really see that kind of pattern or tectonics in other places. Arguably, you do on Earth. I'll come back to that. But you don't really see that in other parts of the solar system. So this is the, the biggest such example we found. I want to draw your attention to a few things. So first off, look at the scale bar here. If you can see my mouse, and if you can't, just look to the bottom right of this kind of inset picture here. This scale bar, top to bottom, left to right, is a thousand kilometers. And if you, you can look carefully, you should be able to see a dashed yellow line. And this dashed yellow line outlines an area that is relatively undeformed compared with its crazy deformed exterior. Now, let me just take a moment just to tell you what you're looking at. This is a part of a global mosaic of radar images. You cannot see the surface of Venus from space with your own eyes. You can see the clouds, uh, which are this global layer of sulfuric acid clouds, but you can't see the ground because light cannot get through. It's not visible spectrum light. So the way we see stuff on the surface of Venus is we use radar. And the Magellan mapping mission was a radar mapping mission. It was a big three meter dish. It had a bunch of different modes and it was able to go and peer through and use what we call synthetic aperture radar to see through those clouds and see onto the surface. And it took these long strips, which then originally were manually and then later with computers kind of stitched together to make these global maps. So when we look at these things, you can essentially treat them as if we we're looking at photographs or mosaics of photographs, but they're not really photographs. They're highly processed data from radar, but we have plenty of experience using radar on Earth and certainly in photogeology, in planetary geology, we have radar for several worlds and, and it's frequently used in geosciences on Earth. But in this, in this view, we're looking at this huge, vast, relatively low-lying area and the lighter colored stuff here is tectonic stuff. It, these, are, these are fractures. These are breaks in the crust. Sometimes they're folds where the crusting pushed together and sometimes they're just fractures where the crusting pulled apart. And you'll notice that there are some pretty dense patterns of deformation around the edge here. I mean, you don't need to know geology to see all these lines. And in here, yeah, there's some lines here, and there's some lines over there, and some fractures down here. But as a whole, the low-lying area in the middle is relatively undeformed. Relatively is doing a lot of work here. But this is the nature of geology. This in and of itself isn't necessarily all that interesting. But one of the things that we found interesting is that when we look at these structures, we start to see an interesting pattern that really hadn't been picked up on before. And let me just illustrate this for you. Again, bearing in mind, this is the biggest example of these low-lying planes surrounded by this, these belts of structures. But the area inside that dashed yellow line is the equivalent of the US state of Alaska. So this is a big chunk of land, of real estate on Venus. I'm gonna just step through three little inset pictures to show you what we saw and to try and help you understand why this matters. So this is box B. Right, there's the red box, and there is the outline there. This is the actual portion of this much larger mosaic. And then all I've done is I put a sketch in here to the right, so you can hopefully see what the hell I'm talking about, because trust me, it took me about five years to not hate looking at Magellan data, which is, it's fractures all the way down. So I appreciate this, it may not be what you do normally. Let me try and walk it through with you. So first off, this bit is that little square there. And in this case, <clears throat> you'll notice, you can almost kind of see light and shadow. And that's because, although it's not sunlight, it's the illumination direction of the radar beam from the radar. And in this case, the radar beam came in from the right. So that means anything facing the right, any kind of scarp facing the right gets illuminated. And any scarp facing the left, away from the radar, is in shadow. So it's, you can treat it as if the sun is shining in the sky, low on the horizon, and you have shadows and you've got portions of the cliff faces that are in, in sunlight. And what we can see is a lot of evidence here for structures showing us the ground's being pulled apart. And again, that's not surprising either. Lots of that on Venus. But what we also see, and you might be able to see where these gold arrows that are pointing to the left are, is these kind of little funny S-shaped little things. They're almost like worms. And these are small. They're about 20 pixels on the screen. These are not small in real life. Look at the scale bar here. This entire field of view is about 100 kilometers or 60 miles across. These things are a couple of miles across. These are huge. You could bring a field trip here and you could do a week of work all around that one thing there. On Earth, that's what we would do. These are huge. They just look kind of small because of the scale of the data we have for Venus. You can't really go much finer than this because the data starts to lose quality. 
And the reason we think we have these kind of weird S-shaped looking things is because we think that in addition to the ground, in this case, being pulled apart, it was also shifting side to side simultaneously. <clears throat> we call that process transtension. This is the name we have from geology. And in this case, we think that the ground had to move top to the left. That's what these little arrows indicate there, meaning that if you were stood here and you were looking at your sworn nemesis over here, your sworn nemesis would move to your left and you'd move to their left. Now, the actual direction, that's not important. There's no geological significance in that. The point is the ground pulled apart and shifted side to side at the same time. Let's look at box C. It's down here in the southwest of this massive system here. Here we have a lot, of, you can see, look at these structures here. I mean, you can imagine that if we had really even higher resolution, finer resolution radar data, we'd see structures in this kind of weird fuzzy area here. We just can't see them because of the quality of the data. But you can see these structures, they're kind of this weird curving thing like that. Like, and that's kind of weird. You tend not to see that. But one way you can explain this is that in addition to pulling the ground apart, it was shifting side to side, just like the last time. And this time, it's going to the right, top to the right. Your arch nemesis is moving to your right, you're moving to their right. Again, there's no particular significance for the actual direction, just that in addition to pulling the crust apart, you were sliding it side to side. Box D up here in the north, this purple box. Here, we have the same kind of S-shaped thing going on, but this time, remember, in, this, in all of these three examples, the light from the radar beam is coming from the right. So now we have this thing, seeing the radar beam, seeing the light, kind of, and then this bit's in shadow, and that tells us this has to be a ridge. This bit's sticking up. If you were to walk from here, you'd be going uphill and then downhill, and you're off you go and you're walking again. So these things are ridges, and they form because the crust is pushed together. Not very much, but it's a, a mini version of how you make mountains on Earth. And again, they have this kind of funny sigmoidal shape, we call that, that S shape. Right? And that pattern there, because if things were just being pushed together directly, it would be exactly like if you took a rug and you push it together, you get rocks, you get folds, exactly like you do in rocks. But those folds would be long and cylindrical. If you were somehow able to push your carpet together, but also kind of like twist it side to side, you get these kinds of S-shaped things, at least in rock you do. And so we think in this case, the ground pushed together and moved side to side at the same time. Now, like I said, there's no particular significance to the direction or even the amount that stuff has moved side to side. What matters is that we see it in a lot of different places. That's one big area. I'm going to step briefly through another area where instead of one monster area of low-lying area region surrounded by these belts, now we have moderately smaller areas, but there's more of them. So this is an area called Lavinia Planitia. It occupies the southern portion of the planet than the Western Hemisphere. The scale bar in this case is 600 kilometers across, so not quite as big an area, still a big area. Like where I'm from, Ireland, is like not much bigger than that block there. So this is not a small part of Venus. And you can see where I have these dashed and then dotted where I really couldn't tell, with these dashed portions of these uh, outlines. These, I think, are low-lying po portions of the crust, the upper brittle layer of Venus, that are physically separated by these belts of really tectonically de de deformed rock. And I'm going to briefly just step through three more of these little pictures. Here's B. These look like ropey folds. They look like rocks in your carpet. The crust is pushed together. But again, they have these kind of funny S-shaped or sigmoidal shapes like this. They kind of step off in an on echelon kind of pattern. And the best way to explain that is you push stuff together and you move it side to side. Let's take a look at C. Again, you have folds which is a classic thing when you push the ground together. But again, you have these funny kind of like step over S-shaped looking things going on here. And the best way to explain that is side to side at the same time as pushing together. And again, it may not look like it's very big on the screen, but that's about six or seven kilometer long structure, four miles. These are big. These would be big parts of some students' geological mapping exercise that we had them on Earth. Let's look at box D. There's more in the paper we published last year, but I'm going to show you one more instance here. This is an area where these structures, these now these are extensional structures, this is where the crust is being pulled apart, but for no obvious reason, this weird kind of S, they do a bend. That's not what they should do on their own. But it turns out that if you push the ground side to side, at the same time you pull it apart, you get this pattern. So the take home message here is that in lots of places, and I'll show you a map in a moment where we see this, in lots of places across Venus, we see evidence for the crust having moved 
side to side. That's not a kind of style we see. Really, there's a few places in the outer solar system, but it is not something we see on Mercury. It's not something we see on Mars. It's not something we see on the moon. We see plenty of it on Earth. And we wanted to know what in the hell what was. Now, it, going back 30 odd years, it has been proposed that perhaps part of the reason we see, not this deformation, this is these are new observations. I mean, the data are 30 years old, but they're new observations. But people have proposed that perhaps stuff was moving on Venus as a function of the mantle churning away at depth, just like it does on Earth. And so we wanted to test that idea. Now, I want to point out, you know, I'm going to show you this map again in a minute. You will notice that we have this global map of these out these blocks outlined in white. There's a really big one that I showed you a little while ago. Here's a small cluster in Lavinia Planitia, but you can see that we found them all over the place. Most of them happen to be in lowlands. There is a sort of a sea level on Venus, and I can kind of talk about why we think, well, how we define it. It's kind of arbitrary. But as a function of where stuff is relative to the high and low terrain, most of these things are at relatively low altitude, low elevation. So we want to know, is it possible that the mantle is doing something in the way that we think it probably must be, given how big Venus is, to be driving stuff at the surface? Because on Earth, plate tectonics, not directly, but plate tectonics reflect mantle convection, which is what the mantle is doing. And convection, mantle convection is exactly what it sounds like. Think of a, a, a saucepan of hot water on the stove. You heat it from below. The warm water rises, moves up, moves away, and then the co cools down because it interacts with the atmosphere. And then that co cold water circulates back down again to be heated up again. And that's what the mantle is doing. Now, the actual pattern of convection is complicated, and there's a lot more going in regards to how the mantle is moving versus how it's expressed on the surface. But it's still reflecting this fundamental process of mantle convection. So we wanted to know, could something like that be the case for Venus? So we had one of our co-authors, a guy called Peter James, published a paper a few years ago where he calculated what the modern day crustal thickness is. Because normally to calculate things like how thick that outer brittle layer of, of any planet is, well, on Earth, we would go and we'd measure it with seismic instruments. We cannot do that. We can kind of do that for Mars now, and we sort of did it for the moon with the Apollo project. You can't do it for Venus, not yet. But one thing you could do is you can use spacecraft data, and I'm going to skip over the details of how we do it. But the take home message is we have a map of which bits are thin and which bits are thick in terms of crust. Now, under the crust is the mantle. You can think of it almost like a, a Mars bar, a Milky Bar, a Milky Way bar. You have the chocolate layer, you've got the caramel layer, you've got the nougat. The nougat, take that as the mantle. We want to know if it's churning, is it able to break through the caramel and break the chocolate on the surface? Is there any evidence of the mantle moving, evidence on the surface of the planet? And what we want to know here is, on the basis of the, the differences in crustal thickness, that means that the upper layer of that caramel is going to be undulating like this with regards to the nougat. And what's the nougat, what the mantle is going to want to do is make everything flat, so it's going to try and flow. We want to know, as it's trying to flow, what are the stresses from this? And how do those stresses compare with what we think the strength of the lower crust is? And, and let me illustrate exactly this. So the mantle is the nougat here. The lower crust we think on Venus is soft. We think it's weak because the surface temperature is so high, self-cleaning oven. So we're, we're going to treat the lower crust as this caramel stuff, this toffee stuff, right? And the upper brittle layer, which is relatively cold. Now, how could you say it's cold when the surface temperature is crazy high? Relatively speaking, it's cold. That's the chocolate. We, what we want to know is, is the stress inside the mantle sufficient to transmit through that weak layer and break stuff at the surface? And the answer is, of course, yes, because if it wasn't, I mean, why would I build up this? But I want to. So we want to go and measure this. And, and we have some estimates for how thick, or rather, how well, also how thick, how strong the lower crust is. We've got some estimates for it. Uh, but they're models. And they could be completely wrong, but they're defensible models, the best we have. And, and the strength of that caramel layer is maybe 50 megapascals. And if you don't know what that means, that's fine. This is just units we use in geology to characterize stress. 50 megapascals. We want to know that's the strength we think of the lower crust. That's not very strong for rock. And we want to know how does that compare to the stress in the mantle? We want to know are they roughly about the same? When you have models and models and you're comparing them, you're not doing a very good job scientifically if you're saying our model is 26.6 and our other model is 25.2. You never get that kind of accuracy and it'd be believable. But we want to know 
if the strength of the lower crusts are around 50 megapascals, what's the stress from the from the mantle moving? And we can calculate that. So we took Peter James's global model for crustal thickness. We can plug it in to do some uh, calculations. Here, I'm going to show this in what we call von Mises stress. That does not really matter. That's just a way we have of characterizing it. But what I want you to look at is the color. Here, the darker stuff is lower stress. Here, there's some parts of the planet that are kind of yellowy, very high stress associated with mantle, with mantle motion. And this is present mantle motion. This is based on gravity data we have 30 years ago. So it could be 30 years out of date, but as a planet 4,500 million years old, this is like today. And if we look at where the center of these blocks are, and we look at what that stress value is, that stress from the mantle moving is eh, somewhere between maybe 50, 75 megapascals. And the strength of our crust is eh, maybe about 50. They're about the same. I don't think you can push this further and say they're exactly this, because that's, that's way too precise for the data we have. But with our models, two different sets of models, they kind of come out of the same answer that the energy, the stress, the force from the mantle of Venus moving is probably about enough to get through that weak lower layer and break the crust of the surface, which provides a basis for stuff moving around. At least it, it accounts for our finding of these chunks of the crust separated by these belts that appear to have jostled and moved. And we liken that to pack ice. We liken it to, if you imagine seeing bits of ice, an ice flow on, on in the Arctic Sea, they can't dive under each other the way tectonic plates on Earth do. But in places they pull apart, you get a lead. In places they push together, you get a pressure ridge. That's kind of the same thing we're seeing on Venus. And they jostle and they move back and forth over time. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing. And this is a kind of behavior that has not been documented on Venus before. Now, the idea of stuff moving generally, that's not new. And a really interesting paper came out that really didn't attract all that attention at the time, but I think these folks continue to work on this. There are places where on Venus, there are very, very large portions of the crust that look like they've collided in a similar way to how India has collided with Asia. Now, I don't know, I don't know that this is controversial. I just don't think this has kind of gotten the attention that it needs to. Um, but Lyle Harris and Jean Bedard published this in 2014, two scientists in Canada, and I think they're right. I think this thing, a huge high standing plateau called Laxupanum way up north, collided with the big northern continent and produced a huge set of mountains that look really like the Himalayas. And I think it's functionally the same process. Our stuff is nowhere near this scale. Our things have not moved thousands of kilometers, but I told you before, that kind of thousands of kilometers movement is what characterizes plate tectonics. It's what characterizes this particular deformation of Venus. But this might be fairly rare. Our stuff is moving a few tens of kilometers at most, jostling and shuffling and rotating and moving. But it's happening in a lot of different places. And it's happening on the basis of what the mantle is doing today. And many of these structures appear kind of geologically fresh. They don't really seem buried by anything, which kind of suggests they formed relatively recently. And so it could be that if you kind of package all this together, you end up with this idea where at one end of a, like a continuum, you have Earth, where you have these, we call it mobile lid tectonics. That's kind of the nature of the, the kind of geophysical regime it's in. We have plate tectonics. The mantle is moving, and through a fairly complicated set of ways, that motion is transferred to the surface and stuff moves. We get tectonic plates. The classic actual stagnant lid worlds are Mars, Mercury, Moon, all shown here to scale with Earth. That's where these shells really are completely contiguous. And really, no, there's no evidence of anything majorly moving horizontally at all. And Venus is somewhere in between. It's not a stagnant planet. It's not a plate tectonics planet either, but it's something in between. And maybe that isn't surprising because it's pretty much almost the same size as Earth. And that has implications for how we make sense of what we're seeing today in terms of its heat loss, whether or not stuff has other things have moved over huge distances in the past, whether perhaps Venus, in fact, is able to take some material on the surface and push it back into the interior, just like Earth can. And that has huge implications for its climate and its geology and then chemical makeup of its mantle and all kinds of stuff. Now, this is new. We're still working on this, but there's more to come in this story. So stay tuned. That's Venus in the modern. Now, for the rem remainder of the talk, for the next 10 minutes, so I'm going to talk you through the second study we did, where we looked back into the Venus past and maybe what it tells us about what could have happened in its past. And maybe it might help us get to this question of these tail of two planets.
Now, if you know anything about Venus, you may have heard the word tessera. And tessera is a, is a word we use to describe a particular terrain type on Venus that is highly tectonically deformed. That's like the classic characteristic of this stuff is that it's really highly deformed. It's got lots of fractures, faults, folds, you name it. This is an example of what tessera looked like. Again, this is a portion of a radar mosaic. I've colorized it, I mean, because radar is sort of, you know, it's any color you want. Usually we go black to white, so it's gray. It's kind of browny color. Uh, but the characteristic of tessera, highly deformed. This is not what rocks normally look like. And, and this field of view, by the way, is a couple of hundred kilometers across. This is a big area again. You know, maybe the width of North Carolina. This is, this is these are big structures. It's also, every time we see tessera, it's the stratigraphically oldest material. It is the, there doesn't ever seem to be tessera sitting on top of something else. Something else sits on top of tessera. And we see this weird dark splotch. Don't know what this is, although on Magellan radar, usually the dark stuff is inferred to be volcanic flows, but it's sitting on this material here like this. Okay, and, and it doesn't seem to be sat on by tessera. It seems to be sitting on top of the tessera, thus the tessera are older. And there was a Soviet land, there was a bunch of Venera landers, the Soviets put off the surface in the 70s and 80s, and Venera 8 landed kind of not on a tessera, nothing's ever landed on a tessera, but it landed kind of downhill from one, we think, maybe. And it took some very basic chemical measurements to the surface, but those chemical measurements found in elevated abundances of radiogenic elements. And that was surprising because that's not something you wouldn't intuitively expect. And some people have proposed that it actually came from the debris coming down off that nearby tessera. The reason that's important is because some people have proposed that the tessera might be a bit like Venus's continents and continental rock on Earth is elevated in radiogenic elements. Now, again, these are like, you know, if this, then that, if this, then that. Okay, it's kind of house of cards kind of thing. But it, it's gotten people thinking. In fact, I know someone who quipped that there are probably more papers written about the Venera 8 results than there were photons detected by the Venera 8 instrument. But the point is, this has been a thing people have been interested in. Now, we've known about Tessera for a long time. We have global maps of them. We can say that they occupy large portions of the planet. Cumulatively, they take up about 7% of the surface of the planet. They're distributed all over the place. They're not evenly distributed. There's a preponderance of them in the Eastern Hemisphere. There's a whole pile of them here in the low uh, low latitudes near the equator. Some stuff up in the north. This is the big continent-like highland I was describing earlier. This is Aphrodite Terra, and this is Ishtar Terra. Uh, but it's all over the place. I'm going to show you some, some images, radar images, from several of these. Because what we documented in a paper in the Geology Journal uh, in 2020 is that some of these tests have a layering that hadn't really been noticed before and that requires some thought in terms of how to interpret it. So this is again a, a part of the global mosaic. This is radar image of the surface of Venus. Bright stuff tends to be rougher, which is something we characteristically see with Tessera because we think it's got lots of tectonic structures and lots of rough stuff all the way down beyond the resolution of, a, of the, the ability of the of the radar instrument to resolve. And uh, you'll notice there's some dark stuff too. And this dark stuff is often regarded as lava. I don't know that it is. Dark just means smooth to the to the radar. Uh, there are two downward pointing blue arrows showing this dark stuff. You can kind of imagine that this is filling in little valleys, relatively small local lows. Uh, and there's a bunch of tectonic structures. There's some tectonic structures here. There's some stuff you can kind of see like a, we call this a fabric, like a trend of structures kind of cutting through the area like this. Let me just bring up this. This is a sketch map of uh, of what I think we see, right? So the dark, the radar dark areas is sort of tan color. Here are structures coming through the area. These are tectonic structures, thin black lines. And you'll notice that there's also this population of lineations like this, these lineaments. And they're pointed to by these upward pointing gold arrows. And, and on the sketch map here, they're kind of teal. And they're kind of weird, and they don't really seem to have the same orientation as the tectonic structures. Uh, and in fact, when you use topography, the topography we have for Venus isn't great. Um, there's a few places where it doesn't suck. So I was able to use one of these areas for this. And if you look at where this is the same view for all three panels, if you look at where these gold arrows are, you can kind of see these lines, and you can almost trace them around like this. And for all the world, they look like layers exposed in the side of a cliff. And that was weird, because layers was not something we would expect to find. This is an example of a tessera 
up here, Telecessor. You see the little the white diamond that tells you where we are. Here's another example of this layering, but from a completely different tessera, thousands of kilometers away. This is one called part of a region called Of De Regio. Again, I can see big tectonic structures that kind of strike northwest. They point up to the northwest. There's a few bits of this in a radar dark stuff. And then where the downward pointing gold arrows are, there's these lines. And these lines look like layering. They don't look like the tectonic structures that are so common, the fractures that are so prevalent inside Tessera. Here's another example. This is an example here in a place called Alpha, Alpha Regio, near, near the uh, Prime Meridian in the Southern Hemisphere. Again, the thin black lines here tell you where the tectonic structures are. And these kind of teal lines pointed to by the gold arrows. These are not tectonic structures. And we don't have topography for these latter two examples that we, that's good enough for us to tell one way or another. But where we have topography, these kinds of lines, these, these lineaments, seem to follow basically hillsides. And it turns out that you can make this kind of pattern by having flat-lying rock that you then erode. This is a Google Earth view of, uh, this is the Burren, a place in County Clare in Ireland. These are Carboniferous limestone rocks. That's about a thousand feet, 300 meters. I've climbed this. It was hellish. You got to here. It was a false top. The horizontal rain stopped for a second, and you saw there was another 100 meters to go. And, and in map view, looking down, you see some pretty complicated shapes. All these curves like this. But these rocks are flat lying. The only reason they look complicated is because they've been eroded in a complicated way. And you can get that whether the rocks are sedimentary, as is the case of these limestones, or if they're volcanic. This is, these are relatively young, geologically young lavas in Kenya, and the, associated with the East African Rift. They are all flat lying, but they've got very complicated map view patterns because they've been eroded through. You have rivers and water, you get rain here in Africa, and when it does, it'll percolate down into these valleys and you get these very complicated patterns. When it comes to looking at either volcanic rocks like there was in Kenya or sedimentary rocks like the ones in, in Ireland, you can get these complicated patterns. This is to illustrate that fact. Here is another example from our paper in 2020. This is the Siberian traps. This is Earth. We're up here in northern Russia. And you can see this area here. I mean, the field of view is only about 12, 13 kilometers across, but these are huge kilometers thick stacks of lava. And even though they're flat lying, even though the lavas are tilted as one or two degrees, that's all. They've got very complicated patterns, as you can see from the sketch map, because they are following topography because they are exposed by erosion. Got some little patterns at the top. And you'll notice that these patterns, they follow and hug topography, completely independent of what the tectonic structures in the area are doing. Now, it's possible to explain this as there are somehow layers inside the tessera that are exposed via erosion. But we don't have, at least present day on Venus, we don't have the luxury of, of monsoon or just heavy rain seasons or the perpetual rain that is Ireland eating down and producing river channels. So how else could you, could you get stuff such that you could erode it away and expose it? Well, one way you can do that, one way you get a head start is you fold the rock. You take originally flat lying rock and you fold it. And I showed you this picture a few minutes ago. There's a lot of highly deformed terrain inside the tessera, including these weirdo looking kind of lenticular things, like these kind of eye shaped kind of elliptical things. And I think they're folds. This is an example near the first example with layering I showed you. In fact, there's even a little bit of layering here shown here by the gold arrow. And you'll notice there's some radar dark stuff again. Is it lava? Is it something else? We don't know. Uh, but you'll notice, and I kind of tried to outline it here in the sketch map with the purple arrows, there are these kind of, again, lenticular lens-shaped or elliptical-shaped patterns. And these things look, at least to me, a little bit like highly eroded folds. In fact, here's an example of where I think you're seeing something similar on Earth. This is the Suleiman Mountains and near the border of India and, or Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, and you can see here that you've got these layers and there are really complicated patterns. And this is just looking straight down in Google Earth. And I've kind of drawn the outlines of these lines here and indicated where you see lenticular shapes left by these, these downward pointing purple arrows. This is another view of that same rock here. OK, this is again Google Earth. It's an oblique view. And the point is that you can see these very, very tight turns like this. And you see these very distinct lenticular shapes. 
And these are folds. And the way you get this shape is that you basically, we call these, the technical term is periclinal fold. You take a bit of rock, and you can even try and do this with a piece of paper, although it's hard with a piece of paper. You take rock and you bend it, you fold it one way, and then later you fold it the other way. Maybe you don't follow quite the same amount. You end up with these very elongated elliptical shapes. And then to get this pattern we see here, you just plane it off. Because Earth is plenty of, even in places that are deserts, like parts of Central Asia, there's still plenty of erosion on geological time scales. So you make folds, some bits stick up, some bits stick down, and then you just plane it all off. And if you do that with periclinal folds, you get these lenticular shapes. I think there's plenty of evidence for folds inside the tessera. And I don't think this is controversial. People have been proposing different kinds of styles of folding in tessera for a long time. So here's kind of what I envisage is happening here. You've got a layer of rocks that you lay down, and I'll talk about what the hell these rocks could be in a moment, but you fold them. I don't know how, why you fold them. You fold them, you push them together. I don't know why, but there's... If we're right about stuff moving on Venus, then there's probably lots of time for things to push rocks together. And in doing so, you make this kind of fold pattern. You have, we call this a synform and an antiform. You have a, a ridge and a trough. And then sh purely through the process of wind, the wind just, even if the rate of wind erosion is low, if you allow a long time for this, the wind just slowly eats away. And, and you already have a, basically a ridge and a trough and now it starts to peel off the outer layers of that and in doing so exposes the component layers of these folded rocks. And maybe some of the dark stuff inside the tessera in those lows isn't lava because we never see volcanoes there. Maybe this stuff is smooth to the radar. It would look dark because it's basically debris that's been sloughed off the edge of this stuff. Now, if you accept that we are seeing layers inside tessera and they've been folded and eroded so those layers remain visible today, then the key question is what the hell are the layers? And there's basically two options. One is that they're sedimentary rocks. And the reason that's interesting is because sedimentary rocks, with very, very select ex exceptions, sedimentary rocks do not form today on Venus. There's no real geological setting in which you could have rocks form that are sedimentary maybe with the exception of some volcanic plastics or ash from from but not not this not this extent so if we were to find later with a mission that went to the tessera or was able to take detailed chemical measurements from orbit or even below the clouds from say a balloon if we found that these rocks were something like a sandstone or a limestone or a gray wacky rocks that say form in the presence of water that would be a pretty compelling evidence that Venus, at least for a time, had liquid water on its surface and would provide extremely strong evidence for scenario two that I described to you at the beginning, that at least for a time, Venus was clement and had liquid water stable on its surface. Maybe Occam's razor says it's more likely, given the fact that about 80% of the surface of Venus is covered in lava flows, maybe there are stacks of lava. This is a picture taken a few years ago about the Deccan traps in India. I mean, you can you can feel, I mean, you know, in North Carolina, summer is like you can feel the humidity in this picture, right? But this is India, and these are stacks of lava. Now, they're eroded because you have an active hydrological cycle on Earth. So it probably wouldn't look quite like this. But maybe, maybe if we were to set down in a Tesla, somewhere we've never sent a spacecraft to before with cameras, maybe it would look perhaps a little like this. It wouldn't perhaps be quite as sharp because we don't have rain vertically that's eroding through, but we would have folding and we'd have wind. Even though the wind moves only a couple of meters per second on the surface of Venus, it's so high pressure that it's like being hit by a deep sea current. It has a lot of carrying capacity in it. So a lot of time to just slowly wear these rocks away and in doing so perhaps expose the component layering. Not in those layers we're seeing, they're not individual flows, but they're probably stacks of flows, exactly like you see in a place like these the Deccan Traps in India, where we know 66 million years ago, several kilometers of basaltic flows were in place extremely quickly. Now, the reason this is important is because it speaks to understanding Venus's past and its present, and that has potential for us understanding even Earth's future. And I like to finish all the talks I gave, the public talks I gave, and even, not even public ones, the scientific talks for Venus I gave. I like to finish with these few slides because the question is where do we go from here? Now, fortunately, like I said at the beginning of this talk, a lot changed last summer when these new missions were, were selected. But they're only the first wave in the necessary missions we're going to have to fully understand Venus and to make sense of it. Because understanding Venus in its own right is important. 
we need to understand the composition, the evolution of its atmosphere. Some of the best places we could look to see if it ever did have a clement past will be in the ratios of certain isotopes of gases in this atmosphere. Uh, what about the composition of the surface materials? What the hell are the tests are made of? Are they, I mean, they're probably chemically altered, but are, are they sedimentary rocks? If we were to have high resolution images, could we see evidence of sedimentary sequences just like we do on Earth? Or maybe they're volcanic. We don't know. And figuring one or the other out is pretty important. And what about activity? What's the interior of the planet look like? Why does it have a magnetic field? Is there stuff moving on the surface today? Like, I think there might be. We can test all these, these new missions. Understanding Venus in its own right is important for understanding it as a world, but it is particularly important in terms of understanding how it fits into the kind of the, the overall pattern of stuff in the solar system, particularly because it is the only other Earth-sized world we will ever get to visit. We will never visit those in other planets, in other solar systems, maybe eventually in the far distant future with the Enterprise. But for the foreseeable future, the only Earth-sized world anywhere else in the solar system is Venus. And if we understand Venus, we will help understand, we will come to understand the rules that govern Earth-like worlds in general, including our own. That's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, so questions are coming in. Let, let me ask you to talk a little bit about what these missions are going to do. For instance, that uh, Magellan radar data wasn't at a resolution that could tell you a whole lot, what, what are we going to see with the new missions? Sure. Okay. So basically, um, so there are three missions that have been picked. So I'll start, I'll go through them briefly. So one is called Veritas. There's two American missions. It's one of the two American missions. And Veritas is a radar mapping mission like Magellan. But if you imagine where we are right now with images for the surface of Venus is a bit like where we were with, say, Viking for Mars in the 80s. Yes, we had a global view of what was going on, and we could answer a lot of very basic and important questions. But for example, since the late 90s and early 2000s, when we began to get high resolution images from Mars, we started to see evidence of active stuff happening on the surface. We saw evidence for landslides. We saw evidence for potential fluvial structures. We saw chemical evidence that we hadn't seen before. So. We don't know what we're going to see, but the new data will be about 10 times better than the current data. That's with Veritas. The next mission that NASA is sending is called Da Vinci. It's going to send a probe through the atmosphere, and it's going to be able to take different measurements of those noble gas isotopes that we think are critical. Now, it won't, it won't be the whole thing because it's going, going, it's going to go through, so it doesn't have very long to take these measurements. But it's going to give us a first-order idea as to exactly what the history of the chemical and climate history of the planet is. And then the third mission is a mission called Envision, which is also going to carry a radar. But radar, mission, radar instruments at Venus are like cameras at Mars. They all do different ones, different things at different purposes. The Envision radar is going to be able to take even higher resolution images than the Veritas mission, but it will do so with smaller areas. It's also going to be able to measure some spectral data, the chemistry of the rock, now at very, very broad scales, but it's going to be able to take some chemical data from space. And it's also, for the first time ever, going to carry a radar sounder with which we're hoping to be able to see through the upper few hundred meters and actually peer through the upper few hundred meters of layers of lava to see what's underneath. And we've never done that before. So, so time scales for these missions? When will we be getting real data and how long so, are you going to have to sit and I know I'm going to have to be patient. Be. I'm going to have to be patient because <laughs> this is, yeah, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, the short answer is I don't think we know yet. NASA has been rephasing or changing the dates, the launch dates of a lot of stuff because they've been working through different budget scenarios and they've other missions in formulation that are taking more money than expected. So the last I heard, which was this morning, the Da Vinci mission is launching in 2028. It'll take about, about a year before you get data. Uh, the Veritas mission, I think, is launching in 2029, but that may change. And the Envision mission is launching in 2031. The ESA missions take a very long time to be developed. So we're going to have to wait about 10 years. Well, eight eight years, maybe seven or eight years. It'll go by in a jiffy. But yeah, we have to, we have to be patient, unfortunately, in this game. Um, so here are a few more questions. One from Tim. Can you speak to the recent publications regarding atmospheric composition changes and or the spectral signature of fresh unaltered olivine on the surface indicating recent volcanism? 
Yeah. Okay. So basically, let me just give a little bit of context for that. So uh, there was a paper published uh, by the PI of the Veritas mission, Sush Mekar, in 2010, where using data from the Venus Express mission, the ESA's Venus Express, which was not really designed for staring at the ground, uh, they saw evidence of what they call changes in thermal emissivity. And basically what that means is they saw places where we know there are volcanoes, we know there are there from Magellan radar data, which is a much higher resolution. It looked like there were there were lavas there that had a th property in the near infrared consistent with them being young, that they were erupted relatively f recently and they hadn't been weathered down. Now, relatively recently is an extremely loaded term in Venus geology because does relatively recent to a human means a few months ago. On Venus, it could be a quarter million years ago. Now, if we found a lava flow a quarter million years old, you have to accept that the planet's volcanically active today because there's no way that it was active for 4,500 million years and this shut down a quarter of a million years ago. That's pretty unlikely. Now, this was exciting and this got into Science Magazine because, lo, it's possible that you could have relatively geologically recent volcanism. Um, a team led by someone called Justin Filiberto, who had been the Lunar and Planetary Institute, where I had been, uh, they did it. They published a study two years ago where they said you can actually take some of these mineral crystals, which we know make up these rocks, and if you expose them to the temperatures at Venus and not the pressure and not the gas, so it's like regular air, but you you bake them basically in a self-cleaning oven, you can make these glass minerals change very very quickly, uh, and you can actually make them change and, and resemble what we think we see on Venus over a time scale of a few days or perhaps a week, not 250,000 years. Now, this was not done in a pressure chamber it's through no fault of the authors. This, this stuff is difficult to do. That was not done in the kind of right chemistry or the right pressure. So we don't know. We still have very poor understanding of what minerals do chemically under those conditions. It's, and it's difficult to test. You can't easily have a Venus chamber because it's essentially a bomb. If you've got a box this big and it's at 92 bars, you're not going to be allowed to put it anywhere because if you pierce it, it will explode. So it's difficult to test this stuff. Um, but, it, but it looked like you could weather olivine and alter it to have similar thermal emissivity as these lava flows over an extremely short period of time, meaning that these flows may not have been 250,000 years old. They could have been, <laughs> they're probably erupting at the time the spacecraft imaged them. The problem is we've never had a spacecraft with a specific capability of actually looking for volcanic eruptions. There are particular chemical and physical things you look for. We've not flown those instruments yet. And these new ones won't quite do that either, but they'll certainly be able to advance our understanding of this quite a lot. Personally, I would be shocked, shocked I tell you, if it turned out that Venus wasn't going gangbusters with volcanic activity. But but I don't know that for a fact, and it is difficult to test. You need new spacecraft data to be able to test it. I'll take this opportunity to do a lot of advertising for you. Um, not too long ago, <laughs> you wrote, you wrote an right. article for Sky and Tell. Some of our amateur astronomers may remember this article on volcanic worlds in the solar system. That was fun. That was fun to do. Um. So would the rotation have any relation to the lack of magnetic field? Uh, that's a good question. And the short answer is, I don't no idea. We don't know why Earth has a magnetic field. Um, we don't know how long it's had as magnetic field. It is true that, that Venus's rotation uh, is very slow. It's one sidereal day is 243 Earth days. Um, probably not. What we think you need for a magnetic field on Earth, we think, at least a modern magnetic field, is you need two things. You need a spinning outer liquid iron core, but that's not enough. You need to have the core freezing and to form a solid inner core. And it turns out it's that freezing, it's that change of phase. It's kind of weird to think about liquid iron freezing, but like when it goes to solid iron, that is freezing. When it changes phase from liquid to, uh, to solid, it releases energy. And that is actually the energy that's driving this conductive layer. And we don't know how important or not it is that the overall solid object that's inside rotates. It's maybe you could have this motion, even if the body is moving very slowly. We don't know is the problem. One of the things that we're very interested in understanding is whether Venus is evidence for what we call crustal remnants. That's evidence of an ancient magnetic field preserved in the orientation of the alignment of iron-rich minerals and lavas. And we do this, this is a thing that we call a paleomag on Earth, and it's done all the time. If you ever go to the beach, you'll often see these weird cylindrical holes into rocks, and that's not some sort of sea creature, that's a 
dirty paleomag person coming with this huge drill and drilling holes out of rocks, often without permission. And the point is they can take these oriented samples, put them in the lab, and they can reconstruct the magnetic field when those la lavas were in place or those rocks were in place. Then they can age date the rocks. And that's how we reconstruct where the continents were way back in geological time. We use paleomagnetism because we have a record of the magnetic field. Uh, we have found evidence for an ancient magnetic field in Mars. We found evidence for an ancient magnetic field in Mercury. We don't know if there's evidence preserved or if it existed of an ancient magnetic field on Venus. But understanding why it doesn't have a field is a really important question. We just don't know is the short answer. Maybe the rotation plays a, diff a role. We don't know. What are the prospects of determining um, an ancient field at Venus? Um, it's difficult to do. So I think I may have said this at the beginning of the talk. We don't know for sure it doesn't have a magnetic field. We just know that it can't be any stronger than some very, very low level. Magnetic field strength decays over one over R squared, the way most things do, right? And so the closer you get, the better you can detect it. Now we have, we got the part of the reason we were able to take remnants on Mars is because the atmosphere is pretty, I mean, it goes up quite high, but it's very, very thin. There's functionally no atmosphere on Mercury, so you can get quite low. And that's the messenger mission did. Uh, to really get high resolution, at least to be able to try and see if you can see across the remnant magnetic field or even a modern magnetic field, you have to be in the atmosphere, which an orbiter can't do. But you could potentially put a magnetometer, say, on a balloon and look for remnants that way. Okay. Um, how long ago in scenario two would there have been water on the surface? So the kind of answer, again, I, I'm sorry that a lot of my questions, my answers are, I don't know, because I don't. But uh, part of the, part of uh, one possibility, we have a series of models are published by a guy called Mike Way and colleagues in 2020. And what Mike was able to do with pretty advanced climate models is that it's possible, I, I briefly mentioned that if you had a big hemisphere spanning cloud, Venus on the night, on the day side, uh, and of course, the planet moves, but rotates. But that cloud potentially would have had sufficient albedo or ability to reflect light to allow the surface to cool down. If it was able to maintain a hemispherical cloud, if, and this is where we're 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 moving a lot of knobs here on the on the on the models to make it work, but it is it's within the realms of possibility. If Venus was able to escape that early superheating phase and get out of or avoid going into the runaway greenhouse effect. The way Earth clearly was able to avoid it. In fact, we know the oldest pieces of Earth we have found are zircon crystals from uh, an area in Western Australia. And those zircon crystals had, had to have formed in the presence of liquid water. So as far back as Earth's record exists, as far as we know it, it was cool enough to have liquid water. If Venus was able to do something similar, this is where you, and I didn't really talk about this, I didn't intentionally talk about this in the talk. This is where things get kind of weird. Because what these climate models suggest is that there's no obvious reason why Venus should have ever then entered a runaway greenhouse. If it manages to survive early on, it should be Earth-like today. Right? So your, your, the answer to, to your question is uh, potentially as much as four and a half billion years. And that's clearly not the case because it is hellish. And so what these climate models suggest is there's one thing at least they could come up with. There could be something else we just, we're not smart enough to think about. But there's one possibility that explains how you can turn an Earth-like world into a modern Venus-like world, and it's volcanic eruptions. Now, we are borking our own climate through anthropogenic climate change, and it is ruining the climate that our species evolved in. But thankfully, we're not at risk of triggering a runaway greenhouse effect. We might acidify the oceans and burn down our forests, and that'll be bad for us, but you're not going to trigger a runaway greenhouse effect. It's possible that if you dumped enough CO2 into the atmosphere through volcanic eruptions over, let's say, a million years, which isn't that long geologically, it's possible if you had enough of these volcanoes going off, you could overwhelm the planet's ability to subduct and draw down that carbon. And volcanic eruptions over about a million years, again, that's not long for a planet, could potentially be enough to trigger that runaway greenhouse effect. Because it's far more carbon locked in a mantle than there is in our fossil fuels. Now, again, Human-driven climate change is bad, but is not necessarily going to sterilize the planet. Runaway greenhouse effect could sterilize the planet, <laughs> kill everything on the planet. And if these climate models are correct, then Venus could have been Earth-like until perhaps about a, maybe a billion years ago. And then something catastrophic happened. And if that's true, and these are all ifs, right? These are just one possible scenario. But the reason this is important is because we need to understand how likely this is. 
if this is true, then you could imagine that perhaps for as long as, to your question, three and a half billion years, most of solar system history, two big Earth-like worlds side by side. It took Earth about less than a billion years for life to just be profuse. I don't know what the hell started life. We don't know how a biogenesis works, but if it happened on Earth, maybe it happened on Venus. Maybe the planet next door is an alien graveyard. We don't know. But under scenario two, it potentially could have been as recently as a billion years. Again, that's not that long as in cosmological time that the planet basically entered this runaway greenhouse effect. Now, if this happened, these are all ifs, I understand that. If this happened, and if it was driven by, you know, humongous releases of CO2 by huge volcanoes, those kind of volcanic eruptions have happened in Earth's history. They've never been big enough to wipe out everything. But the biggest mass extinction in Earth history happened about 252 million years ago when the Siberian traps, which I showed a picture of earlier, erupted and put so much CO2 into the atmosphere that it acidified the oceans and killed 98% of all marine species. It wiped out most life on Earth. Now, life bounded back, but that was a relatively modest eruption. If you had two or three of those go off at the same time, that might be enough to trigger a runaway greenhouse. And once you get to the runaway phase, there's no coming back from it. And these eruptions seem to be fairly random through geological time. And we don't understand what drives them. And we don't understand how common or not they are. So a big question you're left asking is this. Was Venus unlucky if this scenario was correct to have experienced multiple massive volcanic eruptions simultaneously? Or has Earth been lucky that we haven't yet experienced those kinds of eruptions in our rock record. And understanding the answer to that question is the key to making sense of what we see in other planetary systems. Because like I said, we don't know if this, look out your window and look at the squirrels and look at the budding leaves. We don't know if this is a reasonable expectation or if self-cleaning oven is a, self, is a reasonable expectation for the fate of a large rocky planet. Can you elaborate as to why you think that Mars didn't have a large ocean for a significant amount of time? Yeah, Mars sucks, that's why. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll say, okay, so, the, so there, there's, there are big issues with the whole Mars ocean hypothesis. And, and, and honestly, I'm kind of agnostic about it, but I, I don't know. People have based the idea of a northern ocean for a long time on putative shorelines that seem to sort of suggest almost like bathtub rings that there was a big body of sta stable liquid water there. The problem is that over the last 15 years with, with better high resolution topographic data, people have tried to check whether those bathtub rings or parent shorelines are at the same elevation and they should be right like when you have an ocean or if you've got a lake lake michigan for example right it's not like one part of the lake is like 300 meters higher than the other part of the lake that's not how it works and yet that's what we're seeing some of these shorelines are off by a kilometer or two and it's very very hard to make them match and then some people have said well hang on if you if you do the following and if you change the orbital act the rotational axis of mars and maybe the big tharsis area of volcanism changed it, and maybe you bounce it off then you can kind of make it work yeah okay i guess you can but then another paper came out about four weeks ago saying actually even then you can't make the shorelines line up so that's part of the reason. The other part of the reason is because I think more generally, my view is that the hydrological history of Mars isn't that there were large bodies of water for extended periods of time. There may have been bodies of water like Gale Crater and Jezero Crater. I mean, the Perseverance rover is exploring a delta, but whether or not that thing was stable for a few thousand years or a few tens of millions of years or a billion years is a massive question. And it's much easier to have a modestly small lake in a modest sized crater than a northern ocean. So I think certainly there could have been large deposits of liquid water for a while, but they were transient, I would think. They certainly weren't there for a very long period of time. And I don't think there was a meaningful hydrological cycle where stuff was evaporating, going to the ground, raining, all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's, a, big, that's a big open question we still have. So here's one about phosphine. <laughs> do, do you think it exists in Venus? Is there any research into geological mechanisms to put it into the atmosphere to rule out aliens. <laughs> so as much as I, I, I regret having to say this, it's never aliens. And I hate that that's true, but it is true. It's never aliens. We have yet to see any, although we've only been doing this for 60 years, we've yet to see anything that requires us to invoke a non uh, e-biological process. Uh, the phosphine thing, again, this is another question that, about which I'm agnostic. I don't know for sure that we've actually identified phosphine. There's a pretty good case that 
whatever some people have claimed as phosphine might actually just be SO2, which we know the atmosphere is full of. If the phosphine detection in the first instance is correct, and you know, this is a difficult, it's a bit like the plumes at Europa, it's not a straightforward thing, then it could be that there is, I mean, one possibility is that it's coming from volcanic eruptions. And I reviewed a paper that came out late last year suggesting that in fact it could be volcanic eruptions. Then another paper came out after saying, no, it can't possibly be volcanic eruptions because the chemistry of the mantle isn't correct. And I'm like, we don't know the chemistry of the mantle. So I'll say this for planetary science. I tend to rule nothing out except aliens. But I don't know how strong the phosphine detection is at all, much less how much of it is there. And But, you know, volcanoes is a pretty good way of getting phosphine into the atmosphere, depending on the chemistry of the mantle, which we don't know. So I tend to remain kind of agnostic about it, except that it's never aliens. <laughs> So if Venus had the ocean a long time ago and would have been another blue marble like us, could could there have been some sort of plate system with subduction zones there? Does does the role of liquid water um, play a significant role in uh, evolution of plate tectonics? So oh, oh, about six months ago, up until six months ago, I would have been like, yeah, absolutely it does. And here's why. Water does two things. Water helps lubricate the plates that go down, and water also helps reduce the strength of the rock, which is easier to basically make it subduct in the first instance. And then I made some comment to this effect on a, on a Twitter thread, and then I had earth scientists who study the Himalayas going, you have subduction in the Himalayas with no water at all. It's all happening on land. So every time I think I know something, someone else tells me I'm wrong. So I don't know. The, the, certainly the canonical view is that water is necessary. But I was at a conference two weeks ago where people were proposing that there could be a layer. So we know the atmosphere is CO2. It's almost totally CO2. At the pressure of the atmosphere at the surface of Venus, that CO2 is almost like a supercritical liquid. It's more a supercritical fluid than it is an, a gas. And you know, no one's ever thought of this before. We haven't tested it yet. It's possible that this stuff is basically able to percolate through all the fractures in the rock the way water does, say, in a lake bed or a seabed. And it could dramatically weaken the rock and cause it to fracture. But it's not water, It's but it has the same role as water in weakening the rock mechanically. So what does that do? I have no idea. I don't know what that does. I should also point out that a friend of mine who is the PI of the European mission and vision, he likes to take the... He takes sentinel radar data of Iceland, where you have the spreading center, and he downsamples it to the resolution of the Magellan data, and you can't see the tectonic plates anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that if we got really high-res data for Venus, we'd start to see a network of plates we hadn't recognized. That probably won't happen. But we don't know what we're missing with these low-resolution data sets. We just know we're probably missing something. Now, to your question, could this have been going on for a long time in the past? If um, back to the if stacked on if stacked on if. If Venus was clement for a long time, the only mechanism we know of for it to remain clement is plate tectonics because of the carbon silicate weathering cycle. It's so efficient. Now, maybe there's some other weirdo way of doing it. But again, Occam's razor, if Venus was climatically stable for a long time, unlike Earth, then plate tectonics is the most natural thing to expect it to have as a way of keeping itself warm, making sure that the CO2 doesn't go too high or too low to either go to a runaway greenhouse or to an ice house. Snowball Earth, like we know we had 600 million years ago. So the short answer is probably it did, yeah. You know, Occam's razor, why not? If all the parameters are the same, why not form it? But we don't know why plate tectonics started on Earth. We can't replicate it in models. We don't know when it started on Earth. Not everybody in the Earth science community agrees on what plate tectonics is. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. You, you talked about some of the structures as potentially sedimentary rock or or maybe just uh, weathered volcanic rock. The the new missions, are they going to be able to give us uh, some answers about uh, that composition? Yeah, we, we hope so. Um, the good news is, particularly with the high resolution images, we may be able to see things like there are there are sedimentary structures that form in sedimentary rocks. So for example, if you've ever been out to uh, Western US and you can see you know, Navajo sandstone, you see these beautiful sandstone things, and you can sometimes see dunes and forsets and, and basically fossilized dunes. And now you need to see them in cross section. But if there'd been a you know a rock fall or an avalanche, maybe radar data will be able to see very large evidence of dune seas, which would be sedimentary, hands down sandstones. Um, 
Equally, if they were volcanic, you might expect them to have columnar jointing. Think the Giant's Causeway in Antrim in Ireland or or the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. You know, they're very pr pronounced columnar jointing in basalts. Uh, you mm -hmm. might expect to see columnar jointing in this exposed layering, which would be very strong evidence for them being volcanic. So it's the high-resolution radar is, is our best bet for that. Um, these missions, both Envision and, and uh, Veritas, will have the ability of taking... Uh, chemical data from space. The problem is, if you are above the atmosphere, if you're above the clouds, it's a bit like looking through your your hallway pane of glass. It's frosted. You can see if someone's there, but you can't see if they're UPS or FedEx, or you can't read the logo because light is scattered through that frosted glass. That's functionally what the atmosphere does. So when you're in orbit, you can get resolution, but it might be 50 kilometers per pixel. So you're not going to see fine scaled things, but you could see large scale things. If you get under the clouds with, say, a balloon, that changes everything. So is, is there any type of spectral instrumentation that can give you a sense of, of what the rock's made of? Yes. Yeah, so, so there's one thing that there's an instrument. It's the same. It's versions of the same instrument that's going to fly on Veritas and Vision, and they're going to be able to look at basically iron content of the rock. Now, again, like I say, because they're above the clouds, they get that frosted glass effect equivalent. Uh, but they are going to be able to tell how much iron is in the rock. Now, I mentioned earlier that some people have proposed that some tessera might be a bit like continental rock. One of the things that separates continental rock from oceanic crust uh, is the fact that oceanic crust has much more iron in it, or continents have, relatively speaking, less iron. And what we now know from lab work, and really, really hard work a lot of people have done, is that certainly from orbit on large spatial scales, we'll be able to tell if some areas are higher or poor in iron and that is going to be very important but it's going to give us the kind of global view it won't give us the the you know individual flow or individual to read that you have to get under the clouds and that needs a balloon and that's hard under the clouds is around 47 kilometers and it's about 100 celsius so it's technically challenging it's not as challenging as being on the surface but it's technically challenging i have no doubt that in the next few decades we'll see aerial vehicles we'll see rovers on venus because it's all technologically possible. We just need to develop the silicon carbide electronics to allow things to operate there for months at a time. It re we require, if you like, political will and, and actually just money, lots and lots of money. But you know what? In 1997, we had the Sojourner rover, and now we have two nuclear-powered car-sized rovers. So if there's a will, there's a way. So Venus will be the new Mars. In a if I have anything to say, with it will be the new Mars. <laughs> I don't know if I will, but if I if I could, yes, yes, it will be. Okay, so I think we've we've exhausted the questions. Um, so uh, this will be a good enough spot to wrap up. We really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us today and telling. Thanks us so much. I really about enjoyed it. Geology of Venus. Thanks for the invitation, Tom. It was my pleasure, and I'm and, happy to come back. Uh, oh wait, I've got a new question. What useful data? could be received from clockwork rovers which have minimal electronics at all oops too late or not <laughs> <laughs> um the clockwork rovers thing is a fun idea people have been working on these kind of steampunk you know kind of like cyberpunk sort of things where they're based on screws and it's all potential energy in, in a in a spring that drives these things i don't think they'd give us any useful data i think they're cool i'd love to see one on venus but i don't think they would do anything uh the the, the key to doing rover operations on the surface is to have there are folks at nasa glenn in particular who for the last three or four years have been doing amazing science and engineering by developing silicon carbide transistors it turns out that the reason electronics mm -hmm. basically just die under high surface temperature and i should point out by the way what kills stuff on the surface of venus isn't the pressure we can build to 92 bars that's we can build things like that tolerate a kilometer under the under the water on earth we have autonomous submarines that can do that the problem is the temperature because you cannot read yourself of heat it turns out that the reason things die at the temperature is because in our normal silicon transistors the way that basically these basically the, the, the photons move the quantum effects that happen get completely screwed up by the temperature but it turns out that if you make your transistors out of silicon carbide you actually produce you preserve that band gap ability for things to move and not be borked and in the process of doing that you can make electronics that work now the folks at nasa glenn so far have only made very very basic diodes we're a long way off solid state ram or uh, a, a cmos camera but with continued investment 
I'm sure we're going to have silicon carbon. And then think about what you could do with that stuff. If you could develop a camera, you could the firefighters could fly into a burning building, right? Or you could put sensors inside a jet engine where it's 2,000 Celsius. Think of all the weird applications you'd have. You could have a very high resolution camera inside your oven to check on your stuff and never need to worry about burning out the the electronics, right? But we'd also be able to drive cool looking. And of course, think of it this way: the rovers on Venus are going to have to look amazing. They're going to be these kind of armored sci-fi things they won't look like the sort of spindly thing on mars they'll be armored they'll be cool anyway they're probably a couple of decades off but they're on the way so again thanks and um so the next uh, few years will be pretty exciting for you as you prepare for what happens next honestly just watch the space folks there's going to be some really exciting stuff and the venus community is going to grow and in doing so, we're going to make new discoveries and uh, and then wait until we get those data back. Wait till those new images come back. It'll be like learning about Venus all over again. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks, folks. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, our um, next North Carolina Science Festival event is the statewide star party session next Friday night at the observatory and then the Science Hall open house um on april 22nd but uh monitor our website and our twitter page to uh to see about other upcoming events we've got other speakers coming in the fall so thanks again for coming out and thanks dr Byrne, for uh spending the evening with us thanks tom thanks everybody I had a great time and i'll see you again soon okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.